On a dark snowy night in November of 2001, a plane would depart Berlin, Germany, headed for Zurich, Switzerland. On this plane were the dance pop acts Melanie Thornton and the group Passion Fruit, who had just wrapped up shows in Leipzig, Germany, and 29 other passengers, including the crew members, but they would never arrive at their destination. 2001 had been a particularly tragic year for airspace travel, and by November, plane crashes had claimed the lives of several women in the entertainment world, not to mention the men. And on this night, this flight would claim the lives of three more when their aircraft crashed into a wooded hillside just two miles shy of the runway. You're watching Justified by Jury, and in Chapter 11 of the Unfortunate Demise series, we will visit the humble beginnings and rise of Melanie Thornton with her group Labouche. We will explore her solo career and additionally the short-lived pop band Passion Fruit, who had quite a few hits in the Y2K era before diving deep into their last night together, their final performance, and the tragic events that unfolded shortly thereafter. If there are any other artists you would like to see covered in the Unfortunate Demise series, please leave your suggestions in the comments below. Let's get started. Born on May 13, 1967, in Charleston, South Carolina, and the youngest of two, Melanie Janine Thornton discovered her passion for music and entertainment early on, being inspired by records her parents would play and live shows the girls watched on television. She would incorporate those experiences into her own destiny. By the time she was six years old, she was already performing in dance recitals, played the piano, and appeared in several local holiday programs. By the time she entered her teens, she had been taking vocal lessons and mastering the clarinet, and by high school, Melanie would join the dance team with her older sister, who was the team captain, and was excited to take her musical talents to the next level. However, during her freshman year, her father would pass away after a long battle with lymphoma, and the transition wasn't an easy one, as he was also a beloved substitute teacher at their high school, so she was often reminded of the legacy he left behind and the impact he made. But Melanie decided to make just as big an impact at the school, taking up chorus, becoming the school's first black female drum major, and designing all of the uniforms and dance outfits she wore for the school's events, as by now she was also a skilled seamstress. After graduating from Wando High School in the mid-80s, she would attend Fort Valley State, an HBCU near Macon, Georgia. Around this time, she would join a local singing group called Danger Zone, and got paid 50 bucks a night to perform three 45-minute sets with the group. However, the gigs were only seasonal, so she would pick up work as a cashier at a local convenience store to pay rent and utilities during the group's off-season. At this point, her older sister, Lois, was married with kids to a man in the military, so their family moved around quite a bit before settling in Germany. While visiting home over the Christmas break in 1990, her sister would catch one of Melanie's live shows, and was blown away by how much she had improved since her early days of vocal training. Now Melanie had a powerhouse voice that won over any crowd. After the show, she informed Melanie that her husband had an uncle, Bob Chisholm, who was a popular performing artist in Germany's booming music scene, and that if she was willing, they could get her set up over there, introducing her to the right people and having her make triple what she was making here in Macon. And Melanie, who felt like she had reached her musical peak with Danger Zone, ultimately decided to sell all of her possessions and make the leap. Arriving in Germany in February of 1991, she got settled in with her sister's family before they all drove her to Munich the next day to meet with Bob, who had set up a karaoke performance for Melanie at a local cafe. And Melanie, who designed all of her outfits, came dressed like a superstar. She blew the audience away with her covers of How Will I Know by Whitney Houston and What Have You Done For Me Lately by Janet Jackson. The crowd demanded an encore, and she gave them just that. After witnessing her performance and seeing the overwhelming response, Bob knew instantly that they had a star on their hands, and he would add Melanie to his upcoming gigs he had later in the week, offering to pay her from his earnings, and vowed to get her more work and be her guide through the German entertainment industry. All this, and she had only been in the country a day. From there, things picked up, and she became a regular vocalist at several German nightclubs, performed on the local military base where her brother-in-law was stationed, and even got an all-expense-paid gig in Spain, singing at a piano bar for three months. Once back in Germany, she would join a live German cover band called Groovin' Affairs, and they would do gigs at several spots, 
She also snagged studio time, initially writing and singing hooks for upcoming local rappers. She eventually wrote and recorded her own songs. One of the songs she co-wrote and recorded was called Sweet Dreams. She worked with producers Uli and Armir, who were also DJs, and after the song tested well in their clubs, they would use their connections to put the song in the hands of Frank Farian, the mastermind behind the infamous Millie Vanilli duo. Apparently, he had a knack for finding some supreme vocalists to sing hit songs, but also finding models to lip sync and be the face of those musical acts he discovered. By now, Melanie's vocals had been featured on a number of club bangers as a guest vocalist, but nothing where her face was shown. And when Frank heard Sweet Dreams, he just had to meet Melanie. But after seeing her, he expressed disinterest in having her be the face of the project due to the gap in her teeth. But after Uli convinced Frank that Melanie was the real deal, being not only a skilled singer and songwriter, but also being an excellent performer, Frank agreed to sign Melanie and her producers to a two single deal with the option for a full album under his MCI label and sent Melanie straight to the dentist to fix her gap. She emerged with a new mouth. He loved what he saw so much that he wanted to name their project The Mouth as a play on words with her phenomenal vocal talents. Melanie, however, was not amused, nor did she think it was an ode to her talents. So Frank offered up the name La Bouche instead, which meant the mouth, but in French, adding a little razzle dazzle to it. And the team would go with that. Now, the song Sweet Dreams sounded like many other popular Euro dance hits at that time, like Snap's Rhythm is a Dancer and Hathaway's What is Love. But with rap becoming ever so popular, they wanted to add a rap to it. And that's when it was decided that one of her bandmates from Groovin' Affairs, Lane, who was a talented singer, would be the rapper for LaBouche's two songs, as he had the look, talent, and personality for it. Released in March of 1994, Sweet Dreams was initially slept on by Germany, but it went big in Italy, going straight to number one in July of that year. And by September, it was number one on the European dance radio chart, and also reached the top 10 in Austria, Switzerland, Spain, and eventually Germany, as nightclubs everywhere were banging the tune. In the States, it reached number 13 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number 3 on the Hot Dance Club Play chart. Seeing the abundance of success, the decision was made to make a full-length LaBouche album. But there was just one problem. Lane was active duty Air Force, a service member for 15 years at this point, and was committed to his service. Also, Frank only wanted to continue developing Melanie as the main focus and have other vocalists come in and do guest features periodically. He had given Melanie a big cash advancement and said if Lane becomes a permanent member, she's going to have to split her royalty points with him. But Melanie was determined to make Lane her full-time bandmate and would split her royalty points 60-40 with Lane and split the writing royalties 50-50. As Lane leaving his financially secure position in the Air Force was a major move, Though none of this would be in vain, as the group's next single, Be My Lover, would catapult them to heights most could only dream of. Released in early 1995, the single would become a worldwide dance anthem, peaking at number one on the Eurochart Hot 100 and on the Hot Dance Club Play chart. It also hit number one in Germany, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Mexico, Romania, Sweden, and reached the top 10 in over 20 countries. It went on to sell 6 million copies worldwide, and the single won numerous awards and accolades, including the ASCAP Award for the Most Played Song in America. Their debut album itself went platinum in three countries and gold in seven countries. Thank you. Do you do any winter sports? Tried once to ski and, and spent most of the time on my bottom. So <laughs> uh, actually, I went skiing for the first time this January, uh, but I wasn't like actually on the skis. You know, I just was like there. We were discussing okay what we should name the group, and, and the guys were saying the producers were saying you should call it the mouth since you have such a big mouth. And I'm like, ha ha, very funny. <laughs> I don't think so. And then one of the other producers, Big Daddy Frank Farian, says. How about La Bouche? That's French for the mouth. And we're like, well, that's kind 
cool. We plan to release a new album with brand new singles, including the one from the one that we're doing tonight called Bolingo, which is a new single for us. And uh, we'll be beginning a world tour in June. By now, the group were in high demand and in need of a manager that could take on the load. And that's when Melanie would reach out to her sister, Lois, as she was the only one that Melanie trusted with her life in this manner. However, by now, her sister and family had been stationed back in Georgia, so it would be a major move. But after much consideration, her sister agreed and flew to Germany to manage the group, though the decision came at a price for her kids and her husband back at home, and even for their mother, Dolores who would end up retiring a year early and missing out on her pension to move closer to the family and help take care of the grandbabies. But family comes through for family, and I admire them for doing that. But Lois was in for a wild ride as she didn't realize just how intense the fanfare would be for the group. She detailed her hectic yet thrilling time managing her sister's career with LaBouche and as a solo artist in her book Sweet Dreams Fulfilled, The Melanie Thornton Story. And it's a good read. Highly recommend you guys check that out. In the meantime, LaBouche dropped two more minor singles from the project, which did okay on the charts, but nowhere near the monumental success of the first two. Another song Melanie co-wrote called Tonight Is The Night was destined to be a hit, but Frank would have the song with Melanie's vocals on it go to his new group, Le Click, and they would be the face of that particular project. It was quite frustrating for Melanie to have only so much control in the creative process. For one, Lane was looked at as being more of an accessory to Melanie's supreme vocals, providing an occasional rap here and there. Meanwhile, he was a very talented singer himself, but had little opportunity to showcase those talents. Also, for the second album, Frank made the executive decision to buy out the producers Uli and Amir's share in the project, and use previously written songs from his extensive publishing catalog instead, eliminating any chance for Melanie Lane or any of their previous songwriters to write on this album, which would be titled A Moment of Love in Europe and SOS in the States on RCA Records. But shady business dealings with the last album meant that RCA wasn't interested in promoting this new album. You see, Frank promised RCA that the third single was going to be the song Where Do You Go? But in an effort to repair his relationship with Clive Davis after the Millie Vanilli fiasco, he decided to leave it as an album track and instead give the single to his new group, No Mercy, who re-recorded it and gave it a Latin twist, as Clive only wanted that group if that song was their lead single on his label Arista Records. Their single was a huge hit in the States, creating competition with RCA. To add to this, LaBouche had invested over 100k in getting a live band together for their Dance Across America tour. And because this was such a huge investment, they wanted to keep the band for all future live performances, even after the tour ended. This greatly hurt their chances at club performances, as most clubs either didn't have the capacity to host live bands or the budget for travel costs. And back then, club appearances accounted for a good chunk of exposure to new music outside of TV and radio, especially to the group's fan base. And so their sophomore album underperformed. Realizing that she had started to outgrow the group and the process, Melanie started feeling the same way she felt in Danger Zone and decided it was time for a change. She would end up parting ways with the team, Lane and Frank, in 1999 and would sign a new solo deal with XL Records under Sony, donning a new look and recording a plethora of new original material. This time, they wanted to pattern her after Tina Turner, giving her music a live band feel with a pop rock edge. Melanie and her brother-in-law, Todd, would also build a studio together where they wrote many songs. But after a year of writing and recording for the album, the label decided on a track list of 14 songs, half of which were written by Melanie and only two of them, No Tears and It's Alright, were the ones that her and Todd wrote together, which left her greatly disappointed. But they promised her more writing opportunities in the future. The album was complete, but it would take over a year for the label to release it. In the meantime, Melanie bought her dream house in Sugar Hill, Georgia. She already had a nice three-story house in Germany, and the family would stay at both houses as she continuously gave back to her family who had sacrificed and believed in her dream as much as she did. Yet, she was lonely. She had a number of relationships with men who didn't wish to be married or start a family anytime soon, but ultimately her heart was longing to be a mother and a wife someday. She saw the family her sister created and wanted that for herself. Then there was her love for Lane, as the two had a thing for one another. 
Many fans don't know that Be My Lover was actually an ode to Lane from Melanie, but they felt it was best not to mix business with pleasure and didn't act on their wants. But while back in the States, this time Melanie decided to give online dating a try since she felt she didn't have time to meet someone organically. And that's where she would quickly meet a man who she was smitten with and who actually wanted to be married and soon became her future husband. You got to know her uh, per internet? Yes, yes. Yeah? How? As a V? Uh, we put our picture up on the internet and she sent a picture and wrote a letter and we started corresponding after that. It's after the correspondence? A few visits, we, we'd fly and meet each other, I'd fly over to Europe, and I said, I'm gonna marry you. And she's, really? Said, yes. And we ended up getting married a month later. The pair had met in late 1999 and were married on January 15th, 2000. According to the book, The Melanie Thornton Story, Melanie was so in love with his good qualities that she didn't want to waste any time getting married. But a few months into their marriage, problems started to arise and the couple would seek marriage counseling. Eventually, her husband was diagnosed with a mental illness that required medication. And when he was on it, things were good. But at one point, he stopped taking his meds, citing that he felt the family were using it to control him in some way. And that's when things would take a turn for the worst. It was alleged that he had become verbally abusive. Ultimately, he lost his job due to his inability to work with others, but Melanie tried to get him some work on one of her promo tours. He would even make an appearance as the love interest in her music video for the song Heartbeat, in which it depicts them getting married. Things went well during the shoot up until a disagreement the couple had for later plans led to him going on a verbal tirade and berating her on set. Now Melanie, who had held herself in a poised and professional manner at all times, was embarrassed by this and would kick her husband off the promo tour, sending him back to the States, and had also made plans to divorce him, a move that devastated her, but one she felt was necessary at this point as things had gotten too out of control. And there's much more to the story, but I'll let y'all read the book for that. Meanwhile, Melanie had no time to frown. Her solo dreams were finally beginning to materialize. Her album, eerily titled Ready to Fly, would be her first and last solo effort released on May 7th, 2001. It was led by the singles Love How You Love Me, Heartbeat, and Making Ooh Ooh. She would do full press tours and many live performances for this album. She would also reunite with her old band, Groovin' Affairs, and they would tour Germany together again just like old times. And because she had writing credits on LaBouche's old hits, she would perform those songs live in addition to her new music, which actually hurt LaBouche, who by this point had rebranded with newcomer Natasha Wright and even recorded new music. But no one could do the old hits like Mel, and more people were paying to go see Melanie, the original Supreme vocalist, perform hits that they loved than to go see this new version of the band play new songs and try to emulate Melanie on the old ones. Her solo album was well received by fans and critics alike, and some ballads, like Heartbeat, would get a nice dance remix to them, which did decent numbers on the charts. Yeah, I've been releasing singles and having some pretty good success, so I thank God and I'm, I'm, I'm happy, yeah. yeah. And you've made an album. Mm -hmm. The album ready is to fly. ready to fly. It's what released. Kind of music is on it? There's different kinds of music. There's uh, some danceable music on it. There's R&B-ish kind of tracks. There's ballads. Yeah. There's even songs with a little rock edge to it. Oh, really? Yeah. So yeah. It's something for everybody. It's doing. This is Melanie Thornton, and I want to say a happy anniversary, happy birthday, or whatever you call it. To hit maker for four years. That's cool. You know, many more. Ready, that's all. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. While all seemed well in the world of Melanie during the summer of 2001, the music world would be rocked by the sudden horrific death of Aliyah in a plane crash in late August, and America itself would be rocked with the 9-11 attacks just weeks later, and a final time in November with Flight 587, which is the second deadliest aviation accident in US history. A very somber time indeed. And by now, Melanie was in the headspace of bringing back joy in time for the holidays. She would embark on the Coca-Cola Christmas truck tour and was preparing a new single called Wonderful Dream, Holidays Are Coming, in conjunction with the tour. The song incorporated elements of the famous Coca-Cola jingle and would air during commercials throughout the 2001 holiday season. 
And this is probably my favorite Melanie Thornton song. It's a very festive, heartwarming tune that will get anyone in good spirits. With lyrics like, wonderful dream of joy and fun for everyone. Of living our lives in perfect harmony to celebrate a life where all are free. And her powerhouse vocals are on full display. And between that, the instrumentation, and the choir in the back, it's literally the perfect holiday song. I wish I could play it for y'all, but the copyright lord just won't let me be great. But I definitely want y'all to check that song out. The video is on YouTube, and it is bittersweet given the situation, but it's still a wonderful song. And she would perform the song live the first night of the tour. Now also on this tour were the group Passion Fruit, who were a relatively new band and label mates with Melanie. They started out around the same time that Melanie left LaBouche and joined Excel. The group initially was a quartet consisting of members Blade, Don, and Pearl, who were the female vocalist, and MC Steve, who was the rapper slash hype man of the group. They debuted with the party dance track, Rigga Digga Ding Dong Song, which had a very summertime Macarena vibe to it. But again, in Milli Vanilli fashion, the vocals were performed by a singer named Leticia Sporman, and the rap was performed by Kenneth Clemens which meant that everyone was lip syncing on this track. Still, the song was a moderate hit, reaching the top 10 in several countries, including Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, and the top 20 in the Netherlands. And the group did endless live performances, just a lip syncing away, but the girls looked damn good doing it, so they were still well received and they got by for a while. But it's one thing to be in a quartet where only one of the members are singing, but it's another thing to be in a quartet where none of the members are singing and it wouldn't be too long before the group faced internal disagreements and creative differences, which led to everybody being dropped like a bad habit. And starting fresh just two months later, Passion Fruit would re-emerge with three new members, Debbie St. Martin and Natalie Van Hetten, who were backup singers and background dancers from the Netherlands, and Maria Serrano Serrano, who was a trained nurse and model of Spanish descent, but born in Germany. Together, and with Leticia singing approximately 100% of the vocals, the group would release their debut album, Spanglish Love Affairs, in 2000. The group did many performances, interviews, and released a handful of singles, like Wonderland, Sun Fun Baby, and Bongo Man. Their music was mostly Eurodance with bubblegum pop influences. And much like the three original girls, they were quite easy on the eyes. So much so that they would pose topless on the October 2001 issue of Playboy, which was unheard of for a new girl group starting out at the time. But by the time they joined Melanie on the Coca-Cola tour in late November, they were in preparations to release their new single, White Christmas, which was a delightful tune that featured vocals from the girls themselves this time around, and was sure to get everyone up on their feet for the holiday season. The first stop was in Leipzig on November 24th, 2001. The day started off like any other in the life of a pop star. Melanie and Passion Fruit spent the day doing many press interviews and geared up for their performances of the night. Melanie performing her new hit single, which got a positive reception from the audience, before she had to take it back to the classics with her performance of Be My Lover. She also promoted her recent album and had her band Groovin' Affairs backing her the whole way for what would be her final set of performances. Passion Fruit would perform the somber ballad, Do You Remember, which expresses the loss of a lover and wondering, is your heart still mine? Though not sonically similar, the lyrics themselves are eerily similar to Aliyah's Miss You. And the line, I wish you were here at Christmas time, would soon be felt by many fans, as this would be prophetic for two of the members. Also prophetic was what Melanie would say in an interview following the performances when asked about the recent 9-11 attacks. Uh, remember the 11th of September and uh, do you think that this, this uh, will influence the Christmas feeling of the people? Well, I'm hoping that this year people will continue with the thought of, okay, life goes on, let's, let's continue on and, and enjoy. As a matter of fact, make, have more intense joy and intense love and sharing and giving. Um, and you know, in, in in the wake of that, of the September 11th uh, incident, because we all know that tomorrow is not promised. You know, it's 
we have to give the most that we possibly can from all of our gifts and talents from God. And, you know, whenever, wherever, enjoy as much as we possibly can, you know, and, and I don't know, just try to fill everyone with positive energy and, and, and you know, and joy and, and spirit. I will spend Christmas with my family in Atlanta after my last show with Coca-Cola, which is on the 24th in Nuremberg, uh, on the 23rd, sorry, in Nuremberg, I will fly to Atlanta on the 24th, which is our Christmas Eve, I think yours is in Germany as well, and uh, have a nice Christmas morning on the 25th with my family, my mom, my sister and her family, and lots of friends. Just having a great time. How you doing? I'm Melanie Thornton, wishing everyone a Merry Christmas. Immediately following this, Melanie and the girls would be rushed to the Berlin Teagle Airport to catch the 845 flight to Zurich. Apparently there was another performance awaiting them later in the night. However, this performance was at a small nightclub, so Melanie would say goodbye to her band who couldn't go with her. As a matter of fact, none of her original crew nor her luggage would make the flight. Only her road manager, Henning, her sound tech, Mike, and two background dancers would accompany her. Her crew was running late, so they begged the customer service rep to hold the plane, and they obliged. The plane was relatively empty, with only a quarter of the seats being filled. One third of the scheduled passengers hadn't shown up either, so everyone kinda sat wherever. Normally Melanie would fly business class, but with her being the last to show up, she would be seated next to the right wing of the aircraft. Witness testimony from the surviving passengers said that Melanie said hi to everyone and then put on her headphones and listened to her CD. India Ari had debuted with Acoustic Soul that year, and it was all the rave. Melanie liked to listen to it while winding down and getting ready for a show. Witnesses also stated that the members of Passion Fruit were coming off the high from their performance and were quite loud and disruptive, causing the couple behind them to move to the back of the plane, which they feel ultimately spared their lives. Now the aircraft, Crosshair Flight 3597, took off around 9.01 p.m. and was the last plane flying into Zurich for the night. But unfortunately for everyone, the captain operating this flight was Hans Lutz, who was very experienced but very careless. Over his 20-year career, he had countless failed flight exams due to his inadequate comprehension of navigation systems. While commanding a sightseeing tour over the Swiss Alps, he made a navigation error and ended up in Italy. He didn't realize this until passengers noticed billboard signs written in Italian. Also, he completely wrecked another aircraft when he tried to retract the landing gear while the plane was still on the ground. So, he would be removed from being an instructor pilot, but was still allowed to continue flying passengers. Why? Because Crosshair was booming and there was a shortage of pilots, so they glossed over his many mistakes. But this would come at a heavy price, as his co-pilot was relatively new and by all reports appeared to be too timid to speak up. But around 10 p.m., as the plane was gearing for landing, the pilots on the flight before them complained of low visibility due to the clouds and snowfall. They said they couldn't even see the runway until they were about two miles out. Captain Lutz heard this, and as the plane descended, he looked outside for the runway but couldn't see anything. Meanwhile, there was a set of wooded hills just a few miles before the runway and were blocking his view, but he didn't realize this. And rather than rely on his navigation system that would have told him just how far out he was, he figured he was much closer to the runway than he actually was and continued to descend until he saw the tops of trees at just 300 feet above the ground. Immediately he tried to initiate a go around to climb above the hill, but at that point it was too late. The plane would crash into the hilltop around 10.07 p.m., killing 24 out of the 33 people on board. Captain Lutz was killed instantly and his co-pilot dying of internal injuries a short time later. According to one of the survivors, Peter Hagenkamp, about five seconds after the impact, the plane had exploded right where Melanie was seated, ending the life of a shining star with an abundance of talent. She was 34 years old. Her two crew members and two background dancers also lost their lives. Debbie would awake with severe burns and seeing smoke everywhere. She called out for her bandmates, but when neither Maria nor Natalie responded, she knew they were gone. Immediately, rescue workers were called to the hills, which were located near the town of Bazersdorf. 
This accident was the worst accident in decades for Switzerland, and Crossair went under fire for their hiring practices and were discontinued the following year. Melanie's family, who were initially expecting her home on the 26th to spend Thanksgiving time, would now have to make the painstaking task to fly out to the site of the crash. It was just a very sad time for everyone involved. Melanie had been excited to be coming home in just a few days to also see a new love interest too. But the crash ended any chance she had of having that true love that she often sang about. She would, however, be flown home to be buried in Mount Pleasant Memorial Gardens and reunited with her father. Meanwhile, Excel Records pressed forward with the releases, dropping a new version of Melanie's Ready to Fly album two days after her death and officially releasing Wonderful Dream that same day. The single went double platinum in Germany and reached the top 10 in Switzerland and Austria. The song has been celebrated every Christmas, with the commercial airing in Germany every year since 2001, around Christmas time, as the Germans always hold the memory of Melanie Thornton near and dear to their hearts. She's definitely a legend in that country, which is amazing considering her death got very little coverage in the States who were still mourning from recent tragic events. And many people around the world to this day know of Be My Lover, but don't know that Melanie passed away all those years ago. As for Passion Fruit, Excel would drop their new single, White Christmas, and its accompanying music video the week after the crash. And while it was a beautiful video, it also served as a dark reminder of what could have been had the group survived. There are two versions of the song and video, the second one being called Winter Wonderland instead, to be more all-inclusive. The single would chart in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, and would be the last release from Passion Fruit, and to date is the only release from the group available on streaming platforms. But Frank would make sure that Melanie got several posthumous compilation albums released over the years, the first being The Best of La Bouche featuring Melanie Thornton, released in 2002, which features an unreleased jam called In Your Life. And on the one year anniversary of her death, the music video for that song would be released, which features Lane watching a montage of Melanie's videos over the years and a choir singing along to Melanie's inspiring words. And toward the breakdown, Lane recites John 316, putting a spiritual spin on the song, on some Kirk Franklin vibes, as Melanie herself was a spiritual person and her faith in God was always of utmost importance as this life ain't long. The single also introduces a new member to the LaBouche lineup, Kayo, who would be the new voice of LaBouche moving forward, and they would go on several live tours and performances to celebrate Melanie's memory. Melanie's family, however, were in for more bad news. Because Melanie died without a will and was divorced, her mother stood to inherit everything. According to her sister Lois, Melanie was married for 14 months, which would have made her divorce date somewhere around March of 2001. However, her ex-husband's family stated that he had no knowledge of the divorce and that he wasn't handed a divorce decree until the day of her funeral. So the grieving widower and his family would take it to court for three years. And though Melanie's family fought hard, in the end, the divorce was overturned, making him the sole heir to everything in Melanie's name. The family house, the family car, and all royalties from present and future sales went to her husband of 14 months. This is why marriage shouldn't be taken lightly, nor should it be done on a whim, as it holds some serious weight out here, y'all. But anyway, her family, especially her sister, decided to hold firm to the memories of Melanie, as those can't be taken away. Her sister would go on to start the Melanie Thornton Youth Arts Foundation, a nonprofit organization that strives to develop leadership in youth through arts enrichment programs and experiences. Material things are fleeting, core values are not. As the years pressed on, there wouldn't be any new updates outside of the compilation albums. Debbie would post a few messages on the Passion Fruit website in tribute to her group members. And in 2006, for the fifth anniversary, a few media outlets in Germany had caught up with Debbie, who had healed from the injuries she suffered in the crash, and she spoke about her extensive time in the hospital and how once she was back on the streets, people acted uncomfortable seeing her scars. She often felt pressure to cover up even when it was hot out, which is a damn shame that she had to feel that, on top of the guilt that she felt being the only surviving member of the band. Having her friends, her career, and her image taken from her in an instant wasn't an easy thing to be reminded of daily. 
The special also showed her visiting the site of the crash with her family, and she announced that she had recorded some songs for a solo album. Debbie St. Martin ist glücklich. Endlich steht sie wieder vor dem Mikrofon. Viereinhalb Jahre hat die junge Sängerin diesen Moment entgegengelebt, hat gehofft und gezaudert. Jetzt ist sie so weit und wagt das Comeback. However, the album and full release of the song would never materialize, mostly due to her health complications. For years, she struggled with the decision on just what she was going to do with her life. She eventually moved back to her hometown in the Netherlands and got a job as a social worker. Over the years, she's done a few interviews, and while every time she spoke in English, her parts were then dubbed by a German speaker, with no subtitles, as these were German specials. Unfortunately, this was the case for any and every documentary about Passion Fruit and Melanie Thornton, which has upset many English-speaking fans of both acts. That is, until 2011, when the crash was covered in the hour-long Discovery Channel Canada TV series called Mayday, which featured the crash in a season 10 episode titled Cockpit Failure, which at the time was the most in-depth investigation into the crash and featured witness testimonies from surviving passengers, and the special was in English, which was a blessing, though it made no mention of Melanie Thornton. The episode is available on YouTube if y'all want to watch. Now around this time, the original voice behind Passion Fruit, Leticia, would do several live performances of old Passion Fruit hits, as they were hers anyway. She would also re-record the hits Rigga Ding Dong Song and Wonderland for release on all digital platforms. In 2013, she would drop the music video to her re-recorded Wonderland single, letting it be known that after all this time, she is the voice of Passion Fruit, and I'm glad that she was able to get her flowers and just do's. Meanwhile, the woman who was the face of Passion Fruit, Maria Serrano Serrano, will go on to be featured in the Forever 27 Club, which is a phenomenon consisting of mostly popular celebrities who died at the age of 27. No matter the cause, rhyme, or reason, okay? <laughs> Just gotta clear that up for some of y'all who were trying to police me in my video on Orish, saying, no, the 27 Club is only for drug-related deaths. No, it is not. The club is for anyone in the field of entertainment who died at 27, period. You've got people in there that took their lives, some in there who were murdered, and others who died of health-related complications. In the case of Orish, she died of kidney failure. And in the case of Maria Serrano Serrano, this plane crash would take her life just two days before her 28th birthday, making her 27 and a member of the Forever 27 Club. That's how that works, all right? Now, the crash also took place two days after the birth date of her son, Jamula, who had just turned five years old when his mother died. And in 2018, all grown up, he would emerge as a German rapper, signed to the label Life is Pain, receiving the biggest advancement for a German newcomer ever. He would release a few albums and many singles and spoke of his mother on the documentary released 20 years after her death. Of course, the documentary, along with his music, is in German, but feel free to check it out sometime if you want. Today, Lane keeps the LaBouche name going with a revolving door of new female vocalists, touring, recording new music, and doing several appearances, At one point, he re-recorded Sweet Dreams, this time with just him singing on Melanie's parts, which was interesting to hear as many fans wondered why he didn't sing more back in the day. But I'm glad he's keeping the legacy alive as Melanie will forever be with him in song. And the fans keep the music going till this day. Be My Lover has been covered many times and just earlier this year, David Guetta released a future rave edit of the song and it's gotten over 6 million views on YouTube. That's what's up. Now, I couldn't end this video without noting the similarities between Melanie and R&B singer Aaliyah. Now, both ladies were born in the States and died in other countries. Both dropped their debut single in 1994 and their last in 2001, which they were promoting at the time of their deaths. Both released three studio albums, the last of which in 2001, followed by a posthumous compilation album the following year. Both were traveling without their typical family around them and were both running behind schedule at the time of boarding. Both died on Saturday evenings, with Melanie on the 24th and Aaliyah on the 25th. Both of their last days were filmed. Rest in peace, 
Melanie Thornton, Natalie Van Hetten, and Maria Serrano Serrano. This is Justified by Jury. Y'all know how to hit that like, and y'all know how to hit that subscribe. If you want to, do so. And I'm going to catch y'all on the next video.